attention on your time and energy um, and work as well, um, including Mr. Bain. Thank you. So I've been a student at Vista University since 2006. First, I uh, completed a master's in Latin American studies here in the Lapsus program, um, and moved on to sociology, where I'm a, a PhD student. I was a research assistant for two years. I was a teaching assistant for uh, three years, and I've been a project assistant for the past year and a half. And somewhere in there, I was an instructor at Madison College for one year. I've been an engaged community member um, and the co-president of the Teaching Assistance Association, which is the, um, the union that represents graduate students here on campus. Um, and in that position, um, and my, with my engagement with the larger community, I learned immediately of what was happening at Claremont and Milwaukee Big Pizza Company. Um, and I learned immediately of the, the workers going on strike on June 1st of 2012. And I immediately, of course, supported those workers in their struggle and joined the efforts to, uh, to start a national um, boycott against Palermo's Pizza. Um, in the fall, when I, along with uh, other students, learned that our university had actually had business ties with Palermo's and that they were the official pizza of Bucky Badger, um, I was, of course, deeply concerned and offended. We were being sponsored by a company with serious labor violations. So I joined with other students who wanted to alert our university to the practices of, the, of this particular business partner and to inform the student body that our cheap pizza came at the expense of and even sometimes the limbs of workers who worked in very risky um, and hostile conditions. So many of us formed the UW Matt at Palermo's coalition around September of 2012 to address a serious issue and we've been working on the campaign ever since. Um, we've sent several letters to Chancellor Ward as well as uh, athletic director Barry Alvarez and former uh, head football coach um, Brett Vilema uh, and some other members of that athletic program. The membership of the Teaching Assistance Association, the full membership voted to approve a resolution that also urged Ward to drop the contract, so this is also um, a supported campaign by my union. Um, we've had several actions in the past, including delivering pizza actually to Ward's office in an attempt to get him to come out and, and talk with us. Uh, we've done other things like have a vigil actually at the Chancellor's uh, house um, in order to draw attention to the campaign. Um, we joined uh, with other community members in testifying actually to the, uh, the Dane County Board of Supervisors when they passed their resolution urging um, the UW to cut these ties with Claremont's. Uh, we confronted Ward during a UW Medicine showcase um, in front of a lot of his uh, colleagues and we thought you know that kind of embarrassment was an escalation that would actually push him to finally meet with us um, and that was I believe in February um, or March. We also delivered 10,000 signatures for a petition that urged Ward to cut Claremont from our campus. So after all these actions, all these attempts to get just a meeting to start a, a genuine dialogue, he did not. He did not respond. He would never uh, uh, allowed us to come to his office or sit in a, in a meeting. Um, so I really felt like he was avoiding students and he was eluding his actual responsibilities that he has as chancellor. And on top of this, he was ignoring the Labor Licensing Policy Committee, now the LC, LCC. I'll continue to refer to it as the LC, LCC going forward. This is a shared governance body that actually is passed by Wisconsin State statute to advise the chancellor on our labor contracts and our license agreements. So, at this point, with all those actions, with the work of the um, LCLCC, what was it going to take to actually get Ward to address us, um, to have a direct conversation with us? We've never been invited to his office. It became time enough to finally invite ourselves to his office. I remind you that Ward is our chancellor. He is a public figure. Um, this is a public university. His office. Um, is actually our office too. Um, and remember, you know, the fact that it is, is locked and closed off to the public and closed off to students and faculty to begin with is a, perhaps something that we should be questioning, um, but a side point. So I finally felt like I had no other option to participate in the sit-in of April 29th in his office. And to give you some background
more in detail once we were in the office. Um, the receptionist um, actually went directly into the back office. She could have actually stayed with us in there. We weren't doing anything threatening. Um, she could have continued to do her work in there. Um, she went directly into the, to the back office uh, and the police were immediately called. So here we come to his office. Um, we are in the reception area. He is apparently on the other side of that door and he could not turn out to talk to us. Instead he calls the police. Uh, the police immediately came um, to the office, asked what we were doing. We said we were there. I said, because I'm the media general police, I said we are here until war cuts a contract with Blair House. Um, shortly after that, uh, the dean of students' office came and talked with the student uh, liaison to the administration, which was not me, um, and gave us this uh, sheet of paper, which is included in your, your documents, and I have here um, now. For some, um, regarding the and then a little bit later on, the police came and told us simply that this has been declared an unlawful assembly. The building will close at 4.30. We didn't really know what that means, that it was declared an unlawful assembly. We didn't know what it means that they were closing the building at 4.30. We didn't know if that meant they were going to remove us or they were just going to clear the area and just let us sit in there. Um, in regards to the cabinet, um, my statement in my disciplinary conference was that I was involved in moving the cabinet. And what I mean by that is that I saw that there was a beautiful plant on top of that cabinet that was strewn about the corner of the room and I was concerned that it would get broken when, when the cabinet was moved. So I actually held that plant um, and moved it accordingly to make sure that it would not be damaged in the process. So I felt like I was actually protecting the safety of um, university property and something that the, the people who work in the office probably cherish. Um, in regard to um, urinating in the double bag trash can full of kitty litter, that was something I self-disclosed, as um, Mr. Bain pointed out, I self-disclosed that because one, I didn't want anyone else to get blamed for that. And two, I felt that it was a conscious decision I made in an attempt to conform to hygienic standards within the context of that moment um, and not really having any other option. Um, you know, I could go on to tell you, you know, I. I probably have the bladder the size of a squirrel's bladder, and it's kind of when I get nervous, um, but we had been in there for over two hours. The, we knew that we were swarmed by police. Um, people had told us that, that were sitting outside. Um, we could hear it, we could see it. Uh, people sent us pictures of cop cars on the outside and the paddy way down on the outside. I was really worried about what was about to come if and when the police came into that room, and I was getting very nervous. Um, so around 4.30, which is when they said the building was closed, that is when I decided to take care of that business so it was no longer a concern. But again, I tried to conform as much as I could to hygienic standards. Um, and I don't think that that is actually the, the you know, this kind of punishment is not actually the purpose of the non-academic non misconduct statute in regards to students. So, um, as students, we are supposed to be, and as, as faculty members, and we're supposed to be stewards of this university. We're supposed to actually care about um, and carry on the traditions, um, and we're supposed to actually care about its reputation in this world. Its reputation as a socially responsible and a public university. I walk around, well, we're not in Bascom. I walk around Bascom and, and I see these things that inspire me. I see the sitting and winnowing plaque. Um, we're all familiar with, with that. And, and just to make sure you've read it, the sifting and winnowing quote is actually included on that slip of paper that was actually at the same time telling us we were doing something wrong, encouraging us to sift and winnow. Um, so I see that plaque around this university. I see the statue of Lincoln and the engraving around him that says, let us believe that right makes might and in that belief dare to do our duty. Um, if you walk to the back of Bascom Hall, you'll see in front of the diversity office, there's a huge picture of Rosa Parks, a woman who's revered for her, for the stance she took for her nonviolent act of civil disobedience and as a beacon of social change. That is a huge picture in front of the diversity office and it happens to be her mugshot picture. So I'm actually inspired by these images and as a first generation college student, I'm inspired by the Wisconsin idea, the idea that the university belongs to the 
people of this state. Um, and it's meant to actually improve the lives of the people of this state. So I don't know if the joke is on me. Uh, maybe the UW traditions have just become a ploy to attract do-gooder students um, and our tuition dollars. But regardless of how some members of this administration view the traditions of the Wisconsin idea and of this university, I take them very seriously. I'm here to study urban and community sociology and political sociology, essentially the study of historical struggle and community-based methods for social change. So for two years at UW and one at Madison College, I taught a class called uh, Sociology of Race and Ethnicity. Um, it teaches about the US uh, history of racial and ethnic struggles um, and the way that domination has played out in all different fields of life. But a critical part of that class is teaching the civil rights um, and the gains that were made through nonviolent civil disobedience. So it's my job actually to enlighten students on how through concerted tactical strategy by dedicated individuals that sometimes break some rules, they can contribute to building a more just society. Um, and I would be a hypocrite if I didn't want them. So while I'm here today and being punished for violating the student non-academic misconduct code, Ward faces no consequences for break breaking the labor code of is this hypocrisy the new standard at UW? I'm here because I want the standards of this university to be upheld, and I, of course, am not alone, as you um, can see. Also, um, since Friday, we have been passing a petition along. 320 people have signed um, a petition in the last uh, less than five days. And may I approach? And I'd like to read that to you really quickly. It's pretty short. It starts off with a quote, whatever may be the limitations which trammel inquiry elsewhere, we believe that the great state University of Wisconsin should ever encourage that continual and fearless sifting and winnowing by which alone the truth can be found. And that was said by the Board of Regents in 1894. And here are the petition. We are ready to express our support for students who have voiced severe concerns over the University of Wisconsin business contracts with Claremont Via Inc., a company with a record of violating workers' rights and freedom of association. Concerned students have petitioned you for eight months to uphold the UW. And this is directed at war. Sorry. Concerned students have petitioned you for eight months to uphold the UW Madison Labor Code of Conduct, with the support of many faculty and campus workers. After you disregarded letters, requests for meetings, rallies, a petition signed by 10,000 concerned individuals, a request to address Claremont violations by the UW Madison Labor Licensing Policy Committee, and a report by the Worker Rights Consortium detailing the violations, the student felt they, students felt they had exhausted their formal options. They chose to occupy your office on April 29th in the hope that you would finally address these concerns. Instead, they were arrested. You continue, you continue to ignore Claremont's violations of the UW Madison Labor Code of Conduct, yet you choose to punish students for violations of the non-academic code of conduct. Charging these students is an unfair and arbitrary application of university standards, which has a chilling effect on the cherished traditions of political freedom and shared governance at UW. On May 6th, you were asked during the faculty senate meeting if you, quote, agree that the administration should avoid even the appearance of misusing the student code of conduct to punish and suppress political criticism, dissent, and protest, end of quote. You stated, quote, uh, yes, I agree, end of quote, and we do too. On June 26th, Charity Schmidt, a graduate student co-president of the UW Madison Teaching Assistance Association, is challenging her misconduct charge. We join her in standing for the rights of workers and students, and we urge you to take this day as an opportunity to finally do the right thing. We demand you drop misconduct charges against the student. We demand that you respond to the student body, UW employee organizations, the Labor Licensing Policy Committee, the Worker Rights Consortium, the Dane County Board of Supervisors, and the greater UW community by cutting the UW's contract with Palermo VA. By refusing these demands, the university is complicit in the worker rights abuses of Claremont and is jeopardizing the UW's tradition of cultivating social responsibility. The only way to salvage this tradition is by cutting the contract and dropping the 